Hello, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're looking at a subject today that should be an important subject for each one of us. I hope it is. I hope you will stay tuned because we're going to be looking at the biblical subject of forgiveness. And for that, we will be in Matthew chapter 18, and we will pick up our study in Matthew 18, verse 21. So hopefully you can get your Bible and open it up to Matthew 18 while you're doing that. I will remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is a website where you can study the whole Bible, the entire Bible, from Genesis through Revelation. There's three complete series going through the Bible for you to study using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. So if you love the Word of God, check it out. Bring your Bible. That's all you need. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Well, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Forgiveness. Our Lord, our Lord's view, our Lord's teaching on forgiveness, beginning in Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to him, came to Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him, till seven times? And I bet you that's just how Peter said it too, till seven times, and he probably had a smirk on his face. He was way over the top as far as he was concerned. And probably all the disciples who heard him ask Jesus this question snickered as well. Well, uh, out of your mind, Peter. He was in a very generous mood when he suggested that one should be forgiven seven times. It really went against conventional wisdom in those days because the religious leaders taught that people should be forgiven three times and that's it. But whether it's three times or seven times, Peter felt the way most people feel and that's that there should be a limit to our forgiveness. Now verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times but until 70 times 7. If Peter was trying to shock Jesus with his question, Jesus just shocked him with his answer. Not just 7 times, Peter, and not 3 times, but 70 times 7. You know, that adds up to 490. And what Jesus is saying is there should be no limit to our forgiveness. None. If someone sins against you, too many times to remember. You must still forgive them if they repent and if they ask for forgiveness. We are not God. We are not the judge. It's not our business to decide when someone has crossed the line and no longer deserves forgiveness. God makes up the rules and he says, there is no line. 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king who would take account of his servants. Now, Jesus gave a shocking answer, so he's going to tell a parable to explain it. And he talks about the kingdom of heaven here in verse 23. And in this parable, the kingdom of heaven refers to the church. Well, it refers to God's people. So this story is for Christians. It's not for the world. It's not for the unsaved. It is for Christians. This story will show us why we Christians need to forgive others, even when we don't think they are worthy of forgiveness. Notice 23 again. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king who would take account of his servants. And the servants in this parable would actually be the king's governors. 
Like today, the governors would be in charge of a large section of land in the kingdom. One of the jobs of the governors was to collect taxes from their people and then give the money to the king. Well, the king in this story is going over his books to see if his governors have been collecting and then paying their taxes to the king like they should be. 24. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents. Let me tell you how much 10,000 talents is. It took an average worker 20 years to earn one talent. 20 years working at the factory, working at the grocery store, working wherever to earn one talent. 20 years to make one talent, and this governor owed the king 10,000 talents. He's been goofing off. Something is wrong. He's been living the good life with the king's money. He is in way over his head because he has been a slave to his sin. And now he owes a huge debt that's impossible for him to pay. 25. But for as much as he had nothing with which to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. And that's what happened back in those days. He sold himself into slavery, his wife, his kids, in an attempt to pay off this massive debt. And even that won't come close to paying off this debt. And I say that because the top price for a slave was one talent. The top price for a slave was 20 years of a working man's wage, one talent. This man owed 10,000. He has nothing. His situation is hopeless. His life, his wife's life, and his children's lives combined are not anywhere near enough to pay his debt. They don't even begin to scratch the surface of that debt. His sin has ruined his life and the life of his entire family. This guy should have planned ahead. He should have counted the cost before he went head over heels into his sin because he's just ruined everything now and he can't get himself out of this pit that he has dug. 26. <clears throat> the servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And I'm not saying he's a liar, but there is no way that he could pay what he owes. Have mercy on me and I will pay you everything. He, he, I think, I don't know if he's lying or if he's just insane with fear and terror. He's scared to death. There's no question about that. He's desperate and he's talking nonsense. And he probably doesn't even know it. So notice what he says. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. This servant, the king's servant, the king's governor, had been a terrible sinner. But at least he admitted it. He took full responsibility for his sin. <clears throat> he did not make up excuses. He didn't blame it on a bad childhood. He didn't blame it on society. I guess he did the best thing that one can do in a situation like this. He just humbled himself and he asked for mercy. What else are you going to do? 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. 
in an incredible act of mercy, the king completely forgave this man his massive debt. And now I want to go back to verse 23 and apply these verses to us before we continue on. So let's just backtrack to verse 23 again. Jesus said, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king who would take account of his servants. The day of reckoning had arrived for the king's servants. And man's day of reckoning is coming as well. Jesus is returning to judge the living and the dead. 24. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him who owed him 10,000 talents. <clears throat> so he owed more than he could pay. And the Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible teaches that we cannot pay for our sins. The Bible says that all of our righteousness, all of our good works, are like filthy rags when it comes to paying off our sin debt, worthless. Like the man in the story, we don't own anything that's valuable enough to pay off our sin debt to God. We are in way over our heads. And that is what this story illustrates. 25. But for as much as he had nothing with which, with which to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. Sentence was pronounced. Life as he had known it was over. He would be punished for the rest of his life. And sinners need to, be, need to beware. Lost souls need to beware. Because Jesus said, unless you believe in me, you will die in your sins. And the Bible says that the smoke of their torment will rise forever. And they will be tormented forever and ever. That's in Revelation chapter 20 verse 10. Life as sinners know it will never be the same. They will spend forever and ever in the lake of fire paying off a debt that they can never pay off. Every single sinner, which includes each and every one of us, is in the same situation as this governor. We're in way over our head. We owe a sin debt to God that we can't possibly repay, even though we may try forever and ever in the lake of fire. Being punished for our sins, it'll never pay it off. 26, the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. He humbled himself, and immediately he received mercy. And Joel 2.13 says, Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. The Bible says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. We have grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father through Jesus Christ. If we repent of our sins, if we humble ourselves, fall on our knees, repent of our sins, and ask Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior and wash away our sins and take control of our life, our sins are gone in Jesus. Our record is clean. Just like the man in this story, that enormous sin debt is paid in full by the Savior and forgiven by the Father, just as the King forgave this man's hopelessly huge sin debt. Verse 28, but the same servant, the one who had been forgiven, went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. So this guy who had been forgiven this enormous debt 
went out and found a fella who owed him basically about three months' wages. That's a lot of money. But it's nothing compared to the 10,000 talents. It's nothing compared to the multiplied billions that he had owed the king. So again, three months' wages? Yeah, that's a lot of money. But nowhere near the multiplied billions of dollars that he had owed the king. Just like the tally of sins that one may commit against us, though it be large, is nothing compared to the number of sins that we have committed against God. 28 again. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. This guy had been forgiven. A huge debt. But he turns right around and he chokes a man who had done wrong, who had been bad, but not anywhere near as bad as he had been. How quickly he forgot about all the mercy that he had just recently received. And sometimes Christians are like that. Christians are forgiven by God. All their sins are gone. God removes them as far as the east is from the west through Jesus Christ. But when someone offends them, watch out. How quickly some Christians forget about all the mercy that they have received from God. You know, our sins angered God too. I mean, they really angered God. He could have grabbed us by the throat and said, pay me what you owe. And if he would have, we would all be dead and burning in hell. 29. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And you know, those are the exact same words that this man spoke to the king concerning his debt. The exact same words. When he heard this man say, be merciful, I'll pay you everything that, that I owe you, he should have immediately remembered his words to the king. And every time someone says, I'm sorry to us, we should remember all the times that we have said to God, Lord, I'm sorry. Every time someone says to us, please forgive me, we should remember all the times that we have asked for and received forgiveness from God through the Savior Jesus Christ since we have been saved. That's what should happen. So what did this man do? Verse 30, and he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. He would not forgive. Now he was in favor of mercy and he was in favor of forgiveness when he was the one who needed it. But he would not forgive this person who had wronged him. The king forgave his massive debt, but he would not forgive this man's much smaller debt. It is unthinkable that you and I, who have had all of our many sins forgiven by Jesus Christ, it is unthinkable that we would not forgive someone who has offended us and has repented, and has confessed. 31. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and they came and told unto their Lord all that was done. His fellow servants saw what happened, and they could see that what this forgiven man had done was wrong. So they reported him to the king. 32. Then his Lord after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou besoughtest me. He called the man wicked. The man that he had forgiven, that 10,000 talent debt, that multi-billion dollar debt, he called him wicked. Don't kid yourself. Unforgiveness is a wicked sin to God. It is as wicked as as any other sin that can be forgiven. And it is especially wicked when a Christian who God has forgiven refuses to forgive. 33. 
Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? You should have forgiven that man. Who in the world do you think you are to expect me to forgive you, but you think you're so precious that sins against you, offenses against you, are beyond forgiveness? And who do Christians who refuse to forgive think they are? You have the nerve to ask for forgiveness from the God of the universe and accept it when he gives it? You have the nerve to ask forgiveness from the God of the universe who is perfectly holy, who you have offended? You have the nerve to ask him for forgiveness and you have the nerve to accept his forgiveness, but you won't forgive someone else? Are you more important than God? Sins against God are forgivable? But sins against you are not? You are a wicked Christian. You are a wicked professing Christian. That's what you are. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. You are wicked if you don't forgive. 34. And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the inquisitors till he should pay all that was due unto him. His forgiveness was reversed. His mercy was removed. He was forced to pay the debt that he could never pay off. 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother his trespasses. And I would not presume to judge any individual, but I can read. And what I read from Jesus is bad news for anyone who goes to their grave with bitterness and unforgiveness on their soul. Nowhere in Scripture do I read that someone who refuses to show mercy will be showing mercy. I don't read anywhere in Scripture where God says, if you refuse to forgive, you will be forgiven. Jesus, in addition to this story, also says, Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Jesus also says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. A bitter, unforgiving person is not a saved person. Now let's turn over to the Gospel of Luke and finish this up. The Gospel of Luke chapter 17. And let's begin our reading in verse number one, then said he, Jesus, unto the disciples, it is, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Everyone has a free will. So every person is accountable for their own sin. But if someone leads another into sin through temptation, they will share in the guilt of that person's sin. Two, it would, be better for, it would be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Jesus says that a horrible death is better than what awaits a person in eternity if they are one who leads others into sin. It's especially serious when it involves children or Christians who are the children of God, no matter how old they may be. Eternity is going to be a nightmare for those who tempt others to sin or in some way influence someone away from God. Your eternity is going to be a nightmare. Three, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. In other words, confronting those who sin against us must always be done with kindness and with a loving, caring attitude. But it needs to be done. It needs to be done. It should be done with a view to restoring that person's walk with the Lord. That's what the Bible teaches. But it needs to be done. If your brother sins against you, confront them. Because I'll tell you something. If they have willfully sinned against you, they're not right with God either. 
And something else that is taught in Scripture is that confronting someone who has sinned against you should never be done with a superior attitude. It should always be done graciously, but it does need to be done. It needs to be done. Because if it isn't done, they may do it again. They may do it to you again. They may do it to someone else again. Most importantly, every time they do it, they do it to God who deserves better and who hates sin. So if somebody sins against you, confront them. Absolutely. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. If someone sins against you and they refuse to repent, they refuse to apologize, they refuse to confess, then what you need to do is pray for them. The Bible says that we are to pray for those who hurt us. If they do repent, forgive them. You say, well, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like forgiving them. Well, I got good news for you because forgiveness doesn't have anything to do with feelings. It has absolutely nothing to do with feelings. Some of you have never heard this before. But the feelings, they're irrelevant. They may be there. They may not be there. The feelings of forgiveness may or may not come later. It doesn't matter. But forgiveness doesn't have anything to do with feelings at all. Someone says, well, then what is forgiveness? You are commanded to forgive if someone confesses, if someone apologizes. So I guess you better know what forgiveness is, right? What does it mean to forgive, you say? Forgiveness means that you don't dwell on what they did to you. If you have thoughts about it, you redirect your thoughts to something else, hopefully God, and how many times he has forgiven you. Forgiveness means that you don't bring up the offense again. You don't talk to them about it. You don't talk to anybody about it. And it also means that you don't get even. That's forgiveness. Forgiveness is a command. So consequently, if it's a command, it has to be a choice. It is choosing to respond the way God wants us to respond. You don't bring it up. You don't dwell on it. And you don't get them back. If you choose to do those three things, you have chosen to forgive the feelings may or may not come. It doesn't matter. You have chosen to forgive, and that's what God commands us to do. Four, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Someone says, man, we can't take this literally, can we? Someone says, this can't possibly mean that I must literally forgive someone seven times in one day. And you're right. It doesn't mean that. Don't you take this literally at all. In Scripture, seven is the number of completeness. Jesus is saying, forgive them as many times as they apologize to you. In other words, if they sin against you 20 times in a day, or 50 times in a day, or 100 times in a day, and they apologize to you, and they confess it to you, and they repent a hundred times, then forgive them 20 times or 50 times or a hundred times or whatever. That's what Jesus is saying. And you know what? Yeah, this may seem hard, but look at it this way. I am so glad that Jesus commands us to do this because it reassures me that God forgives us as often as we sin as long as we repent and we confess and ask for forgiveness through Jesus Christ. So I don't see this command as being a burden. I see it as being a blessing. God does not put limits on his forgiveness toward us. So we must not limit our forgiveness of others either. If there's someone you need to forgive, then do it. You see that your immortal soul is at stake. From what Jesus said, you've seen it. And I'm not watering it down. I'm not going to twist that scripture. It is what it is. It doesn't have to be interpreted. Those who would interpret these verses on forgiveness and the command to forgive or else, the only reason they would interpret it is to explain it away because it is so crystal clear. If you need to forgive someone, then do it. For more of the Word of God, Go to the Scripture Verse by Verse website and study the whole Bible with me, verse by verse, from Genesis through Revelation. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember, I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. This is a faith ministry, so if you want to be a part of this ministry and help me get out the Word of God, 
then please pray for me. Pray for the Word of God. And also click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give us the Lord may lead. Be a part of this ministry, would you? Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.